there's there's probably somewhere somewhere with a research document that says this this audience are into retro things, yeah. so that's how they're selling it. Yeah. But I think it's probably bollocks. I think. Like <laughs> <laughs> Today, I'm having a gas with Troy and Phil, who are the ECDs at Leith. There's a phrase that gets thrown around like a bouncy ball in this city. It's like, this is Manchester. We do things differently here. <laughs> and it's a, I think it's either a direct or a paraphrase quote from, from Tony Wilson, who ran yeah. uh, Factory Records in the Hacienda. Yeah. Again, it's always these things in Manchester we've got this ta- yeah. we've got this one thing we did and it was really cool so we focus on that mm-hmm. forever we've got Turing Steam and yeah. Hacienda and in you know uh, Scotland it's for a, it's 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 with a slightly different flavour but there's a strong strong sense of identity that isn't present I think any uh, in many other places in the UK and yeah. so um, you know maybe for those reasons we feel kind of like kindred spirits um, but so is this the, is it also the beginning of you guys trying to start a network, trying to maybe move beyond this, or are we just staying with this for now? I know it might be kind of getting a bit ahead of ourselves to be saying <laughs> you're going to open lease New York. It's an interesting question. It's a good it's a good question. I think again for us, it's about again well concentrating on the people. I mm. think the people is what always drives any agency. I mean, you can get different names, and as you, as you know, people move about agencies all the time. So to get the right people, I think, would would fuel any kind of decision where, wherever we go. And I, I think Manchester's obviously the focus now. It's about yep. getting the right people and also tapping into the the talent that is in Manchester. I think that's really exciting for us. Again, it's, it, obviously we've been in Scotland for so long and it, again, sometimes Edinburgh seems like it's miles away. Yes. Whereas Manchester, even though it's a little north, but it's further south than Edinburgh, yeah. it's quite, a, and it's, it's a hub of talent. So, so tapping into that feels like it's an exciting thing to concentrate on now, but it's not to say that we wouldn't be looking more ambitiously yeah. again globally. And, and again, we our owners aren't uh, based in the UK. They're American companies. So, really? Yeah, so I think it, it, it's not, like we haven't had those conversations about mm-hmm. where we could go next. But yeah. I think for us, again, it, we have to start and go back to our simple managing that growth is really important in terms of what kind of agency do we want to be? Yeah, that's, you know, that's what kind of agency do we want to be is an interesting question because um, there's a former Leith person who moved down here who we spoke about off mic, but I'm not going to reveal him on on the record, who, uh, you know, he's saying one of the, um, one of the, benefits but also one of the drawbacks of being at Leith this was some years ago now mm. was that uh the clients tended to fall in a very you know there, there was a pattern it's like we've got Scottish water Scottish rail <laughs> Scottish government <laughs> is there do you think that's a bit of a typecasting thing people clients have done with you it's like no you do Scottish stuff we'll do other big brands I think probably to an extent over the years yeah we've we've attracted those those bits of businesses uh you know those those clients but um and, and and still do you know we we still work on the Scottish government account yep. is one of our biggest clients. Um, when I first came up to visit you guys, I was like, oh, that's Hollywood, right outside yeah, the front door. Yeah, so. and we do Royal Bank of Scotland and we do Scottish Power, and it's, yep. so there's, there's plenty of these kind of Scottish names on our on our roster. But um, I think increasingly over the last kind of um, certainly since we um, become CDs, um, it, it, we're thinking beyond that and. and we're attracting kind of uh, clients from all over the place. Yeah. So, uh, is that part of the ambition with opening this new office? You're wanting to really cast uh, the net uh, further afield? Uh, absolutely. It is, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, again, we know there's a lot of clients down here as well that are looking for that kind of creativity. But obviously, that's it's a dirty word sometimes, but value in terms of what, what you can get for your money. And I think I think that's where Lee's always played really well is in, in terms of what we do for for the kind of cost that we have. And you have yes. to be honest about that again, yeah, yeah. compared to a London agency. Is, we, we always kind of think that's a good thing to offer. And I think there's a lot of clients, especially in this area, that, that will be looking for that, especially we talked about uh, off, off uh, camera about like, a, we're going into recession next year. Yes. That, these are the questions that most kind of clients will be asking themselves. Where are we going to spend the money? They'll and, be looking for where can we get the, say, the, the, the quality that we expect. But a, a lot of these London agencies are hobbled by the fact that the costs are often calculated to pay for 150 salaries. Of, yeah. of course. And it's yeah. the same with like New York office. So, so it, it, again, it, it, they, they, those things do drive it. So for us, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a really interesting time to be in this area for for, uh, for, for that reason alone, yeah. that you're going to get access to talent. But also, I think there's, like you said, there's an underdog spirit that will drive the quality of work still, which obviously we still believe in. So. Yeah. There's, yeah. um. Oh, sorry, are we going to... No, no, I was, was going to say, that. I think that that's always been at the heart of everything that Leith's done, hasn't it? That kind of creative edge and, yes. and that, that's, that's part of the culture of Leith. Uh, and, and building that reputation is, 
is absolutely uh, key to anything we do. So whether whether we're here, whether we we you know in future go elsewhere, it will always be about um, the work, the creativity, and how do we um, maintain that reputation and and keep creativity alive wherever we are. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. You you know both of you have intimated that one of the reasons this is now possible is because the technology has improved in such a way that. Uh, certain, what would you say, certain levels of quality are no longer gate kept by extortionately high prices. So it used to only be possible to get cinematic standards of quality working with a few production houses and a few post places, but it would cost a fortune. Now everything can be cinematic for very, very low cost. And like you said, everyone can be connected um, very conveniently by technologies like Zoom and, and Teams and other video conferencing software. So... You know, uh, I, I do you think that's part of? Do you think that's going to play to your advantage? You're really going to be trying to work on that on that advantage to say that the quality is going to be basically the same as you would get anywhere else. What's going to be the point of differentiation for working with you? You know, if it's not going to be the cost of the production, uh, you know, if it, so, it's if you can get high quality for a decent cost. What makes Leith? What's the X factor mm. that you guys have? I think. I think. Tell me. I think, look, coming from Leith, we know that again, we have to kind of punch above our weight a little bit to even stand out within our own industry yep. in advertising. Yep. As a brand name in the advertising world, we were like, look, again, we're based in Edinburgh when everyone else was based in London. That Having that as your kind of ethos of it as an agency really helps play that into clients that need to punch it beyond their weight. No one, right. under, no one understands that better than when you're, when you're born with that like because we all know we naturally we're not going to get the the nikes of the world coming in if we have to be honest with mm -hmm. that we're not going to get them knocking on our door and go we want to go to leave yep. so what we normally get is clients that really want to punch above their way really need it to stand out and use creativity i think is yes. is their weapon to stand out and i think that's what we can offer because again we our kind of before our time even like leaf has been born on that kind of You've got to make a mark. You've got to stand out. You've got to engage in our own industry, never mind how we bring that to clients. So I think that's a, a real advantage that we've had that's in our DNA, which was set beyond us, but we, mm -hmm. we carry it through now today as well. It's interesting that you mentioned a point there about being realistic about your expectations as well. You said, you know, we're not going to get a uh, Nike knocking on the door mm -hmm. of Leith, but that kind of, um, that kind of realistic expectation married with uh, competence of what you do can actually be something that uh, is is valuable to the clients. And what I mean by that is every single brand, uh, I work in music, as you know, and what, mm. of, what often happens is the brands say, uh, when you say, what do you want to sound like? And they'll say, I want to sound modern, contemporary, edgy, <laughs> and very cool. And it's like, you are a legacy brand. This is, I'm not going to name names on camera, but I'm working for one at the moment that's like an institution, like old brand. And that's what we really like about it. Yeah. And they're saying, we just want to be cool and like catchy and modern. It's like everyone, that's the same brief everyone gives. Or is it? Tell me in your experience. Is everyone like, yeah, we just want to be up to date. It's really, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you get a bit of that. You definitely, <laughs> definitely get a bit of that. Um, I think it's always up to us, and it? it's always you know it, it falls on the, the the creative shoulders to try and break out of that, doesn't it? Yes, and try and do something different, try and push beyond what is expected and what everyone kind of wants. Because yeah. when it comes to briefing, it it and, and I feel your pain because I, I I know that's what it's going to be like, you know, because uh, you've seen the same old thing. You know, we, we want something like that. We want something, and it's always like something else. Yeah, and it's it's a. Yeah, it's a bugbear of ours because we, we're always trying to <laughs> create yeah. something new, aren't we? Yeah. And, and I'm sure yours as well. So, Well, one of the things that you guys do really well is obviously you handle Iron Brew. Mm -hmm. And that's like, I, th I get the impression from looking at the stuff you make for Iron Brew that that's the brand you get to have the most fun with. Mm -hmm. uh, I get the impression that the client is quite bought into everything you're doing. And um, uh, and, and humor seems to be a huge part of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly one of the clients, yeah. It's certainly yeah. one of the clients. I mean, humor's always been a massive part of what, what I is all about, isn't it? But from an outsider's perspective, that would be the first thing that strikes me as uh, as a real point of difference for you guys. It's like you're, a lot of advertising tries to be funny, but mm -hmm. the Iron Brew stuff often is, and that's the yeah. difference, yeah. you know, because, again, f you know, funny is something that is hard to do by committee. And I get yeah. the impression that... W may, I, I don't know exactly how you guys work, because usually I'm just selling into yeah. you yeah, guys. Yeah. Yeah. But I get the impression there's not too much committee thinking, too much, let's there's, have every 24 junior clients sign it off first. There's, you know? there's, 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 there's due diligence, I'd say, if I'm going to put it politely. Yeah. I think there's, there is, it's probably not as free as you probably think it right. is. 
but it's be, I think what what it tends to happen is we, it's a long standing client with a great relationship. Yeah, and most great client agency relationships is built over time. Yeah, and like you use that and that length of service in in some respect to kind of have real honest conversations about what will work and what won't work. Right. I think that's again that's something that we're really lucky at. Uh, been at Leith is that we've got, most of our clients have been with us for years and years and years. Yeah. Yes. So you build up a rapport, which then lets you push where you need to be in terms of humans, human needs that. You need to feel comfortable with having conversations which sometimes you go, we're going to do this. And you go, no, you're not. Yes, we are. No, yeah. <laughs> if you fear that you're going to lose the client, that you're going to say that, then you've, it's very hard to be funny. And I think, again, that that is definitely an advantage that we have at least we do humor runs through what we do a lot of stuff and it's not just i and boo i mean a lot of our scottish government work we do yeah. is funny on topics that uh, shouldn't really be funny like yes, we, we, yeah. we deal with cancer in a humorous way we deal with road, road safety in a humorous way and to be honest there's, there's probably not enough of that humor coming through what i'd say is the kind of most clients that we see like you, we were talking again earlier about things looking and feeling the same yeah. and i think humor is a great way to kind of puncture that because yeah. Again, if you tell the same joke seven times, it's not as funny, is it? So you have to constantly think about different ways of approaching humour. It you're forces really, you. You're really going to find that. If How old did you say you're? you're... Oh, my, my child's uh, 15 months, I think. Right, so uh, you'll remember this, right? When they're very young, when they first learn to tell a joke, they'll tell it and they'll get a laugh and they'll go, right, let's do that again. <laughs> again. again. <laughs> like, why doesn't it keep working? It's like you don't have new jokes, I'm afraid, every yeah, exactly. time. Well, so it's like a good fresh. joke if you can keep telling it again. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Some clients like to keep running the same <laughs> advertising. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we were talking about that before we went live. This is, mm. we're about to, uh, so the, um, uh, what, the, what is it, ONS, Office of National Statistics? One of them have said, yeah. we're not going into a recession, we're already in one. It's yeah. already started yeah. Yeah. Uh, crunching. And we were saying that um, uh, one of the things, there, are, you know, there are, there are a couple of things that we can expect to happen. And this is where hopefully we'll be watching mm. you guys to <laughs> avoid this trend. Uh, one is less risky communications. Yeah. Um, and the other is that, you know, marketing gets pulled first. Mm -hmm. So not only is there more risk aversion, there's also less money to play with. So uh, have you guys in your ex uh, career, have you seen this before? Yeah, I've seen yeah. it a lot there. I think it, there's always two schools of thought and uh, I think in, in recession. There's, there's always the argument that you should be out there. It's yep. a perfect time to be out there, actually. Yes. Um, if you obviously got the money to be, to be out there making a noise, and I think it, it's it's just in that in that kind of um, time, I think humor and, and and creativity is probably more important than ever. Yep. Um, and it, and if I think yeah, I see it as an opportunity because if if some clients are risk averse, as you put it, and and kind of you know cutting things back and not being quite as out there as they perhaps should be, then I see that as a massive opportunity to to actually do the opposite of that yep. and go out there and uh, and show the benefit of that because, um, okay. you know, that's what we've done for for the likes of Iron Brew and, you know, that underdog spirit is a massive yes. part of it and um, we, we've done that for years and years and I think that's that's what we'll have to do again and what we'd be encouraging our clients to do, I think. Yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think we'll definitely find that the best clients will see it as an opportunity. I think the... What, what you listen if you listen to any entrepreneurs podcasts these days they tell you that recession is the best time to start a business it's no yes. different for marketing it's when you can make the most impact by when everyone else is pulling back if you can stay strong and and make the impact at that point it will it'll pay tenfold than what it would be in a market when everyone's got the money to spend the money what's the uh, is the analogy this is a circuitous analogy here but is it like uh, and you, you'll have to you have to go with me at the first bit. Of this. Is it like it's like everyone's outside doing effectively a mating dance to try and like, try and then it starts raining and everyone runs inside. If you can stay outside, you'll be the only one there. I like it. Exactly, and I think that I think that forces people just to think about where they spend the money, which we've talked about. But then, if you spend the money well, mm -hmm. it it has huge impact in terms of business. I think you've got because you'll there's not as many people out there flooding the market with what I'd say is sometimes dross, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. so it's like you kind of have to again stay strong. Again, we you'd be unrealistic to think that the money won't go down. Most marketing departments in a recession will see a cut in 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 their kind of marketing spend. That's that's always the case, but. It's it's to what degree? Yes, and I think that's mm -hmm. the bit where the smart again clients will will see that and then invest wisely with that pot that they've got and 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 hopefully see some kind of reward from it. I think you know it's funny that we um, dovetailing the two topics that just came up. So this is both using humor in advertising and also how to weather a recession. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you ask people, 
in the industry generally more than out um what are the best ads of all time two of them are uh you know primarily you know comedic ideas mm-hmm. that were made during a recession and that's Cadbury's gorilla mm-hmm. and which i think was during the recession someone might correct me and say it was 07 but uh, we'll we'll fact check that and we won't cut it out if i'm wrong <laughs> and the, the other was uh, old spice you remember yeah. the big old spice yeah. revamp yeah. which yeah. was a, a, a huge I always think that one's a little bit more impressive than the other ones that people mention because it's actually did rejuvenate uh, the brand yeah. a very old yeah. brand yeah. but that yeah that was done with humour as well as you know the Tide ad <laughs> yeah. To yeah, the Super Bowl yeah. Yeah. so um, so you know again this this may be a, a unique a yeah. point of advantage for Leith you know can do humour <laughs> can weather a storm because no one can do that like the Scottish yeah. let me tell you <laughs> and, I mean yeah I mean Look at the world we're living in. There's so much bad news. Yep. Isn't there? Yep. <laughs> and what we've found, obviously working on Iron Brew for all those years and then Scottish government as well, is that if you speak to real people in that scenario, they make a joke of it. So, um, yeah, and, and again on the differentiation thing, I think a lot of clients I'm seeing at the moment are trying to say we're uh, greener than other clients <laughs> and that's becoming less and less convincing, not only because it's less and less convincing, but when everyone's <laughs> saying it. Yeah, you I know, mean, it was again. It's true. it's it's a it's a marketing fad. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um. It all businesses need to become greener. That's a that's a fact. Yeah. But to what degree and, and at what point do you need to start to advertise and talk about that? And what role you use in advertising to talk about it? I think I think again, the audience is just sick of it. They've, yes. they've seen it. They they, they kind of expect it. Yeah. So if you start to do make a song and a dance about it, you're like, well, you should be doing that. What the earth? Are, do you know what I mean it's like you're trying to get praise for something that you should just be is what you should class, be doing anyway. It's it should like be hygiene, you know. Shoelaces exactly, and I think I think that's when you get again. That's when real kind of customers just get pissed off a little bit and go, "Fucking hell, you go flogging that again to make me feel better about you." It's yeah, got, it's got to be tangible, hasn't it? it has always to be always like where is this greenwashing is real, and and there's there's clients and brands out there talking about doing stuff, and you think you try and investigate it and go, "What are you actually?" Yep. doing and yep. there's there's not a hell of a lot of substance behind the yeah <laughs> the facade you know so well, uh, most people are like a lot of, uh, there's a you, if you set up a rule a lot of people can creatively circumvent the rule very quickly <laughs> and we were on uh, uh, me and one of the other producers were out in italy at a um harbor uh we weren't in a, it's not a mafia environment. Uh, <laughs> we, we, but yeah, we're, we're in a harbour, in a port, and there was a big vessel there that said, zero emissions while at port. It's like, yeah, it's because you kill the engine while you're at port. <laughs> like, that's, that's not much of an achievement. Kind of um, no, have you guys seen any other ch- uh, trends like that in advertising before this, where it was like, everyone's saying that now? Because I'm, you know, obviously, as you can tell, really, really young, and uh, now I just turned 30. But this is the first one since I've been in the industry that I've seen. I think, again, I think, controversially purpose is a is a whether it's a trend or not I don't think it's a trend it's weird because we've worked with the Scottish government a lot and it's not like that that's not a purpose thing it's like again we've, we've worked with a lot of health clients that, yeah. uh, through the through the time and it's what what you see is that's becoming more and more to the front of advertising in terms of and we've 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 got it now kind of specialists in health. We've got a health arm, and it's come off the back of our work we've done for Scottish government on like cancers or organ donation and stuff like that. So it felt like a natural transition for us to go into there. But actually, while looking at that work and talking about that work, what was really interesting is to see that there's a real merging now of kind of what would be old school advertising agencies that would never touch any kind of health topics around mental health, for instance, yep. or Again, societal health in terms of again welfare and stuff like that. So it's it's weird seeing that there's like above the line agencies that you would never touch it are now merging into that world. And right. then you've got the old healthcare agencies that would be classed as pharma agencies coming more in the health and wellness space. And I think how purpose knits out for brands, I think, will be interesting. I think yes, there's some some of them it fits like what Phil says. It, some of them it fits really well. So again, we know that Dove's got a great reason to be talking around some kind of health issues. Other brands that you kind of think, why have they done that? It's more a stretch. It's a stretch. It's a push. It's a, and it's and I think that's again, chasing awards a lot of the time in terms of our industry. It's and and and, yeah, we we seen that a lot. If you look at most award shows, it is now a a kind of health award of some sort. You know, it's like we we were talking about campaign big awards last week that Mm -hmm. was just announced, and the two major winners there were kind of Hope Line Nineteen and again, the last photo. Two great stuff. Last photo was there's the for the ment, uh, mental health. So basically, suicidal. Was yeah. it not not calm? Calm, calm. No, that, was it. calm was, yeah, that was calm. Yeah, was right. Yeah. So, so so again, they they would have been traditionally seen as kind of health campaigns, yeah. but now we're, we're, this is kind of done by Adam and Eve, and it's the person that we know for John Lewis. It's 
we're seeing what I'd say is traditional advertising agencies coming more and more into this space. Well, it's really, um, it's a real head scratcher for me how, um, I, as far as I could tell, purpose-driven marketing became popular because it became very unpopular to basically show off about how much money you were helping people mm. to make. It became yeah. seen as a bit gauche. So effectively, like an an anti-capitalist ethos made its way into marketing yeah. and like <laughs> took control of the yeah. agencies. It's like, we don't make money for people, we raise awareness. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. NGOs. I think, yeah. I think that's it. I think some brands are going to go through this transition of doing that and then realizing, well, again, recession's a classic one. Where, a lot of them are going to go, yeah, no, we need to yeah. make you money. Need, you need to flog carpets, you know? Yeah. It's not about, like, again, so it goes back to, it, and it's not to say that that's the right way to go. I think, that, again, having a purpose is, is important, but it, it has to be tangible yes. to the thing you're trying to get someone to buy. If it's just a tacked on thing that you'd marked and to make your brand look good, I think, again, the, the consumer now is well-versed with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It kind of understands that that's what marketing people do. Yeah. And they can, you can you see it in on, on, on Twitter, especially people taking the piss out of advertising, yeah. trying to flog them something that you go, well, what's that? How's that relevant to cat food? How's that yeah, relevant yeah. to this? How is that? So I think it's something that I think the, the industry is becoming aware of and how we deal with it is going to be interesting. Like, the, so um, if this is, this is, what we're touching upon here really is effectiveness, isn't it? Yeah. And I was at BBH a week ago with um, Alex Grieve and Helen Rhodes and I, uh, one of the questions I will uh, I had for them, I'll throw at you now, which is that a lot of uh, creatives, I, uh, you know, have their own like website or something to yeah. basically a, a permanent CV in case yeah. they need to shop around quickly. <laughs> and um, a lot of them say, uh, I made this campaign which won a load of awards. Yeah. None of them say I made this campaign which increased sales 5% yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Why is that? Why is the awards more important to them and their employers? Uh, awards is the currency for a creative and it, it kind right. of always has been and probably always will be. Um, yeah, so it, it's always massively important. Um, so the people who worry about the uplift on sales, that's more like your strategy in yeah, I mean, business. I mean, I mean creative, creative directors do, do as well. Yeah, we do. They, yeah. they, they absolutely do. And it's, uh, you know, you, you can, it's like Troy said, if you, if you can see through a bit of work that, that feels, you know, created just for awards or yep. that, that doesn't really feel right as if, you know, anyone ever saw it or yeah. and all those kind of things. So I think... You, you look out for stuff like that, and you get a sixth sense for stuff like that. The more, the more you're in the industry, but it it is still the currency. Yes, and uh, and all you know, we're all uh, we all like to win awards. We like to, yeah, we do, we do. <laughs> and like uh, I did, but, uh, I'm being a hypocrite because before we went live, I was like, should we not put our DNA D pencil? You know, but um, but um, yeah, it's. Um, it, I de it definitely vexed me because I was like, surely clients would be beating down your door if you're like, when I work on something, it can say, let's yeah. go like that. I yeah. think, again, I think we need to get better at that, that yeah. as an industry. I think, again, it's, it's again, they're not mutually exclusive, you no. know? Creativity is proven to actually improve, again, effectiveness to, to campaigns. It, it's guaranteed. There's so many papers written about it. it. It, they're not mutually exclusive. I think what we've got really bad at is awarding campaigns that, that do don't well. do both. Yeah. I think that's where we've lost our way. I think, again, you mentioned DNAD there. Most of the stuff, if you go through over the years, back to the, were really effective campaigns. Right, The right. best campaigns that you'd see that were driving sales that made the brands that we know and love like today. Like Guinness and Levi's exactly. and all this like stuff. All these mm. top brands that you would class as legacy brands yeah. now made their name off doing really good advertising. And also made their name off serious expansion uh, and uh, like transforming the perception of the brand because yeah. Guinness was like old man drink that takes exactly. a million years to pour yeah. exactly. and then it became cool and young. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was the award winning stuff. And that's the power of, again, great creativity. It, again, it's not, I think it, it, we maybe get a bit lost and it's like creativity becomes a frivolous thing that you just add on to yeah. stuff. Again, that's not something that we ever look at, Leith, is going, we just, it's just like a little bit of fairy dust you speak on. It's got to be baked into what are we trying to get someone to do or again, again, persuasion has kind of disappeared from our industry now. Yes. I think there's another thing where persuade someone to do something or look at something differently or think about something differently. Yeah. So again, we, we, we see a lot of that in our Scottish government work where we have we, we can't mess about. We're talking about trying to stop people <laughs> from getting cancer. Yeah. So we're not just frivolously going, we're going to make a funny ad and if it doesn't work, who gives a shit, you know? Yeah, we care. Each person who avoids getting cancer, Except, that really matters. It matters. It absolutely. Absolutely. Same road safety, every road safety death. Like you, so you don't approach this thing going, we just want to be like the, as funny as possible. Yeah. And I think yeah. we've got, as creative directors, you manage that. You try and make sure that we, we're being creative and we're being humorous, mm -hmm. but it's going to make it more impactful and yeah. better for it. It's not just a thing that you just tack on at the end. So It reminds me of the, um, 
I, again, on every single podcast, I end up quoting Mad Men. Um, <laughs> and uh, Draper says, um, you know, you're not you're not an artist, you solve problems. Yeah. And maybe the work gets less effective when you get less, uh, further away from that and start thinking, actually, I'm just making a film here and <laughs> I'm using someone else's budget for it, you know. Absolutely. It doesn't, it's, it's hard not to go down that avenue, you know. It's yeah. great because some of these brands are, uh, it's it, not uh, is obvious in terms of what you're selling or what uh, what the message is. So then it means it's even looser. But I think, yeah, I think it, it, it's quite easy these days to get lost in the thing of oh, I'm going to make a again a 90 second film, two minute two minute film, yep. and forget about actually what the purpose of it is. Yeah, and just go. We want to use this director and get the sound like that. And isn't it beautiful? And you're like, yeah, great. And then on to the next one. It's it's you- not that tangible for clients. I think that's why clients don't respect us as much as they used to if you've so been the, the more you pursue that strategy of, a, of treating it like it is window dressing you're just giving the clients a reason to sack you at some exactly. point exactly no definitely right do you do you guys have any opinion on the what would you say the um uh the, the increasing influence of leaning on old intellectual property to get things across so mm-hmm. Um, at the moment, everyone's going mental about or going, getting very enthusiastic about the Asda campaign, which features a movie from t- 19 years ago. Um, Kevin the Carrot on Aldi is a parody of Home Alone, which is 30 years old. You know, <laughs> is this, uh, uh, what was the thing that started this trend? Direct line, Harvey Keitel, Winston Wolf. Again, that's oh, yeah. 29 yeah. years old, 28 years old. Um, do you, what, why do you think that's happening? Does it bother you when you yeah. see it or does it not... Uh, it, it doesn't really bother me. I really love the Asda ad, to be honest. Yep. Um, I think that's a, it's it's just done very well. Um, so it, I think it's it's a lot of fun. There's there's probably somewhere somewhere with a research document that says this this audience are into retro things. Yep. So that's how they're selling it. Yeah. But I think it's probably bollocks. It was like <laughs> in um, I think it was Alchemy. Rory Sutherland pointed out that if you just have an animal in your advert, it will perform better. You know, like so there are yeah. some things that you would yes, yeah. you could yeah. accidentally just lean on like that. But yeah, I think again, I think what what those things do is it shortcuts the the kind of writing that you need to do as mm-hmm. well. If you're being brutally honest as a creative, it's easier to. Because someone's done all the legwork, you yes. know? they've created the character that's funny, that's done the thing, <laughs> and I love, I love the Asda. I think it's the best Christmas ad this year, bar yeah. none. But as a writer, in terms of, well, I'm not very much director, but I was a writer. It's kind of you know that that's easier because someone's done the legwork. Whereas we talked about the old Spice ad, for instance, that's much harder because yeah, you're yeah. creating the character from scratch. Yeah. And again, it's it's, it's kind of what we used to, when I used to call it, it's like borrowed interest, but mm-hmm. borrowed interest isn't bad. It's, right. If it's you use interest. it, if it's, it's it's if you can leverage it and use it well, and it's goes back to what's in. If it's right for that client and it's going to shift some more turkeys at Asda, then use it. Go yeah. ahead, crack on. Mm-hmm. It's it's just, it's sometimes for me, it's it's slightly easier because you've got someone that's done some of that notoriety, that impact, that, oh, that's that person. That's that famous person. That's why, yeah. you, that's why from the age of time you use celebrities is because it's a shortcut to go, oh, that's that. Yeah, you're right. That's, not- not, that's not enough just to use that. You've got to package it up in a really creative way. But I think it does shortcut the process a little bit than trying to create a, kind of character from scratch. I would say it's certainly harder without the budgets <laughs> of that <laughs> as well, totally. isn't it? What do you mean? That, Sorry to get well, the... the budget to actually pay the film studio or, yeah. or Will Ferrell or whatever. But how much do you think they'll have to just drop a load just oh, to use all of that? Yeah. I'm sure. Oh, you know, I'm never mind the cost some, of cu- yeah. cutting it out and producing yeah. it. But. Yeah, and, the, and I think there's there's a little bit of um, kind of some some nice craft in there, obviously, mm. and the, and there's there's probably a nice little bit of writing in, in, in amongst yeah. just to for the writers um <laughs> just in, in amongst get you know watching the film 60 times and then working out which bit could go where and the, the bits of writing around that and the, there's maybe bits in there that, that that add a little bit of creativity so yeah but um but yeah I, I'm, there's millions more brands haven't got the budgets to go and do that so i think that that's that goes back to the conversation we had about you know how, how do you compete then how do you how do you make an impact how do you do something that's gonna um outdo asda but without that kind of budget and that, that you then have to rely on your creativity those yeah. are the yeah those are the, those are the ones that give you the respect when it's like you could do it without all of that existing yeah. ip yeah. but you know i feel like a fool now because um in music this has been since day one it's like yeah. well we're, we're not going to make anything we're going to use a track that's already out yeah. there and actually in the case of music it's not at all uh <laughs> controversial it's, it's what you do yeah. and if you can't afford it only then do you make something new and i used to say uh, it's like why do they always use commercial tracks instead of creating something new they don't exactly like i don't know go and just make an ad out of scenes in a film it's like now they are doing that yeah. 
<laughs> because it's possible for the first time. Yeah. So uh, we'll see how it progresses, I guess. Um, yeah. I know you mean the celebrity advertising. We just lost, uh, we as a species, uh, we just lost George Lois, uh, mm -hmm. passed away uh, mm -hmm. a few days ago, one of the greatest mm -hmm. of all time, one of the best art directors. And when you um, when you said a moment ago, Phil, that it's like we used to just use celebrities to get that value. But all, all the famous George Lois stuff was like Muhammad Ali, <laughs> it was Richard Nixon, you know. So yeah, you borrowed interest, right? Yeah. Using something that's already out there is not bad if you're trying to be effective. It, it definitely isn't. I mean, again, it, it goes back to what it feels like. If you can afford to do it, then then absolutely, that that would make it's a shortcut to the process. I think it helps, and I think if you can add a twist to it as well, it becomes doubly impactful. It's like again, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. What Arnold Schwarzenegger's head is on a skateboard that's going through. I can't remember what that was for. But but you mean it suddenly goes. Those things suddenly, it's like it's the impact and then a twist on it. it it's absolutely powerful. So I think you should definitely use it if you can. But I think again coming from Edinburgh, we, most of our clients wouldn't be able to afford to do anything like that yes. because even we've talked about, we've talked about music, we can't, we can't afford the big tracks. You ain't going to get, not going to get someone to rewrite that track in a lovely ballad, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not, it's not going to happen. We can't afford that artist. We can't afford that. So it, it, it comes down to like old school writing. You're going to have to try and write if either, that's why humor is a big thing in Leith because Humor, you can just write on the page. Yes. It's not you. Do, you, you. It's either funny or it's not. It's not like it's going to be this big soundtrack, and we're going to use that celebrity. Yeah. Because they cost loads of money. Yeah. Whereas if you're like, this is the joke. It's like that's the joke. So it, it, yeah, we are born out of the circumstances of of the yeah. kind of clients that we've got. That's not to say that we can't do the. You know, give me some loads of money and I can do a celebrity. I'd fear that'd be great. But <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, we'll just reappropriate some footage from Braveheart and put it in. Uh, <laughs> no, I shouldn't. I shouldn't lean on those lazy references. But um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, Flipper Neck has made a stupid joke, and now the point I was going to make went out of my head. No, it was that um, humor is like the dance music of writing, and what I mean by that is James Murphy of LCD Sound System said that he got tired of indie because it was just really like pretentious. Uh, mm. Everyone, people, it was just to look cool and to sound cool and to be like really. But beyond that, what was the point? Like what happened when you played the music? But you played dance music. If people dance, it worked. Yeah. And if they don't, it didn't. Yeah. And with humor, it's like, it's, is it effective? You know if people laugh. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. great when you go into research groups like that and watch people not laugh. Because <laughs> <laughs> be so then, then you, you just get, honestly, you just get ironed out in the wash, doesn't it? You're going to go like, oh God, here it is. It's uh, you don't laugh at that joke. Nothing no one worse. found that funny. Worse. There's Nothing no, worse. there's no justifying it. No, beyond you that. can't. Like, no, but they will get it. Yeah. Mm. Whereas when you kind of the cooler side of our industry, where you show a couple of mood boards and you know it's like, oh, it's going to look like this. Yeah. This person, gonna, it's kind of slightly looser, so you can get away with it. And directors have got a bit more freedom to massage that. If your joke's not funny, your joke's not funny. It's kind of you can't. No matter how good your director is or kind of what you do with it, it's kind of always a bit of a risk to go in there where you've showed 40 people and none of them have laughed. I know what you mean, actually. Yeah. Like, I wondered if that was maybe one of the things that was an initial sort of stone in the shoe of advertising effectiveness is that we... I mean, I, I, this is a wacky out there theory that I've not researched, so I'm going to say it anyway, <laughs> that as more and more people went through the process of going to university and uh, more and more people learn to kind of just justify anything with an argument because that's a lot of what you, you learn to write at university. So it's like, justify this, here's a proposition. Um, more and, it, may, it just seems like more and more of it became, uh, what would you call it, subjective, arguable. It's like, uh, this the thing that's happening in this ad represents the idea that your brand is trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I guess you could say that, but you know, <laughs> with the, with the humor, it's instant and you yeah. know if it's working or not. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. particularly in the, in the digital world, you know, cause people share it and they talk about it. Yes. You know, so that's, that's, it's an instant thing for, and if they don't share to know about what, it. you know, what, what, what people are talking about, cause they're, yeah, they're sharing it. They're talking about it. They're commenting there. It's that kind of, instant response which is yeah which is good for our industry i think it gives you an idea of what's what's working and what's not yeah and on that note i feel like we're on a fault line historically because it's again something we were going over before and and, and i wanted to get on the record a little bit is that um <laughs> We were talking about the fact that the way things are for teenagers now isn't a version of something that's come before uh, generally speaking so when i was a teenager you know we'd watch uh, mock the week, which was generally mm. like 
uh, what not the nine o'clock news or something like that. Or have I got news for you? It was it was juvenile, but it was like something yeah. your parents watched. And oh. we listened to the Arts and Monkeys, which was, you know, teenagers, but being a rock band like the oh. Sex Pistols. Uh, you know, you've both got kids. Yours is not a phone owning <laughs> age yet, but you know now, um, you know TikTok or and things like that. Short form, yeah. nine by sixteen, quick content is the thing. Uh, you know, and so the I guess the question is something like. The, that generation is not necessarily going to recognize all the tropes that we trade in in advertising. Do you think the whole thing is going to have to transform a lot in the next 10 years? Uh, it's a great question. Because um, uh, socials are still seen as a kind of ancillary kind of marketing, right? It's like one of many different types, but it's not the main one. Or am I wrong about that? I, I think, think you're probably wrong. Okay. I think that's, that's shifting. And I think it's because of the exact thing what you've just said there. I think it's... The, the, the market has changed. That's the thing that's becoming apparent. And I think we're all scrabbling around. Every agency, any one agency that tells you that they're completely all over it is, is lying. Right. Because because no one can be, because yeah. it's so vast and so fragmented. I think that's a, that's an issue with agencies. And I think it's an issue for creatives, I think, as well. as We've gone from where we used to be able to have the, the rigor of craft of writing a 30-second ad for about 40 years. And that craft of writing that same thing and having to do the same thing, which meant the work got better. When the kind of when the game changes, it's like you just have to do the bare minimum right. to be in the game. Yeah. And there's no, we'll do this for 10 years and we'll get really good at it because it'll change. Yes. So I think that's why the industry is really going to have to try and get a bit, again, think smarter about it, how we do it and how we keep that level of craft that was traditionally TV and outdoor posters where write a nine, nine word headline, yep. write a 30 second script. And it was going through generation after generation. And you had a great benchmark of where it was at. And that rigor helped writers and art directors hone their craft. Yep. Now it's like you're doing 40 different bits of media for every campaign. Yeah. It's hard to then think you're going to go through the rigor. The fundamentals are the same in terms of persuasion and mm-hmm. impact. and But how you play that out is that that's the bit that we've got to manage in this terms of creativity. Deal. The John Hegarty quote, uh, when he said, "Practice has changed, but principles remain." Exactly. And J- there's a guy at Ogilvy, uh, well, Hogarth, technically James Brook Partridge, who said something that really made me think, which is that you know the six-second YouTube pre-roll or the Instagram ad, that's not new. <laughs> Short advertising, a billboard was like the original yeah. cut down. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like you only have a couple of seconds to glance at it. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, it's yeah. not like it's yeah. a challenge that's never been faced. Do you think maybe the, those of us who like grew up hoping to be able to do big cinema things and big TV things, it's like, that's just, it's not going to be that, but you're still going to be delivering, you know, I, I think a solid still, message. I think there's still a bit of that. Yeah. Still a bit of that there. And I think there's still opportunities to do that. Um, there's no doubt that, you know, that a lot of the media is now going to short form TikTok and, and short form film. Yeah. Uh, like, like you say, kind of... It, the principles are kind of the same as well. They kind of, you know, get someone's attention in the first couple of seconds of an ad. That's like, that's been the principle of ads for yeah. forever. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's still different. It's just, I think people's mindset is slightly different with social, I think. And sometimes their, their heads are, you know, like everything has to be kind of, um, very uh, like user generated or have that feel and be native to the channel and all that kind of stuff. And I suppose as creatives, we're all always trying to go, well, if everything else is like that, shouldn't we be doing something that's slightly different to, yeah. to that? So we always have that kind of attitude to it, I think. And I think that's, yeah, it will continue to evolve and we'll continue to to try and keep our principles of uh, persuasion and, and getting noticed and uh, and actually doing something that, that people like as well, you know? Yeah, that's the main thing, right? That's like, I mean, that people like that is entertaining be like f- first you know you cannot deliver any messaging if you cannot get their attention and hold it yeah. and i feel like entertainment's been in a bit of a recession mm-hmm. for uh you know about half a decade yeah. it's not been the pinnacle value yeah. and uh hopefully like you said in a genuine recession yeah. what tends to happen is you whittle it back to first principles yeah and so yeah. you're hope gonna so. have to be getting attention yeah i hope so i mean yeah. it, d- it does feel like yeah it's it's tricky because what, what what seems to have happened is the kind of the media is kind of telling a lot of agencies how to use the media, mm-hmm. this is, which is weird. It's like a TV company coming in to tell you now how you make a TV advert is like this, <laughs> this, and this. A lot of social app is, is a little bit like that because of the data that they hold in terms of they do like in Facebook, this of all the Facebook video ads, they know that within the first three seconds, you need to put your logo on and you have to do this. And then people, if people aren't engaged by seven seconds, they do that. 
it, yeah, like Phil says, that's one dimensionally we're looking at data based on a whole lot of dross. It's <laughs> it's not the best way to analyze how do we make impact and how do we persuade people at mm. that stage and how do we hold that interest. That's where creative people think of it slightly differently and start to challenge what, like you say, what everyone else is doing. Because if there was a formula for it, you just chuck it into a machine and it would get chewed out and, yeah. and it, it would make it, make it itself. It's so weird now you've meant, put, put it in those terms though, because... Um, you know, one th if you if if someone asks you a quen a question by answering it, you're accepting the terms of the question, and that's kind of an analogy to say that uh, something that Chris behind the camera, people at home won't be able to see him, and I uh, complain about a lot when we're driving to and from these sort of these podcasts, um, is that the behaviour that's optimal on things like YouTube and things like Instagram. Uh, is well no the behavior is optimized to get more and more attention for those platforms so that their share price goes up so the advice for how to make a better youtube video is so that youtube can be more yeah. addictive so that yeah. google becomes more valuable yeah because youtube are giving that advice yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, well, it's slightly dodgy so in how to be most effective on the platforms we're actually accepting their terms which are to yeah. inflate our share price yeah. Yeah. do you do, do we uh do you guys think that you know what do you guys think about the proposition that we currently are in a bit of a uh, an era of uh, big first to the finish line monopolies. You know, Facebook owns mm -hmm. WhatsApp and Instagram, so we're all on planet Facebook when right. you're in those. You know, uh, when you're in those channels, and you know, think you, you're starting to see the uh, Uber has like a kind of monopoly in people's brand yeah. imagination for yeah. you know uh, instant uh, ride sharing, but Bolt is really growing in mm -hmm. this in this city. So I guess mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, you know, do you think in uh, you know, another 10 years time or so, it will still be all about uh, YouTube and Instagram or do you think there's going to be more challenger brands in the media space? I think I, th I think there'll be challenger brands. I think things might swap out. I think, again, there'll be... But I think there's still... Globalisation is globalisation, which then inherently leads to fewer brands, which leads to kind of monopolies in areas in every in every sector, whether yep. it's, again, social or whether it's transport, whether it's... It's kind of... It, it naturally happens when you're trying to be a global business because that's well, once you've grown within a country, you have to grow globally. Mm -hmm. That drives it. It goes back to your point about capitalism. Kind of, it's just a never-ending growth thing where you have to constantly go into that. So it's going to be hard to see that there's going to be like 20 different social media platforms because I don't think there's the kind of appetite for that breadth. Yeah, that's right. Whereas, again, and, and that's a shame because I think, again, it's the difference now between brands that used to be in the market and it was like everything was quite UK centric. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we operate as global kind of, and yeah, we are in the UK, but lots of brands are global brands. And that has an effect on when you go in the supermarket, the brands you see, the what the normally legacy brands from ages ago. So it's it, there's not loads of new up and coming brands can break through and then make that mark without having loads of spend. And I think it's very hard to challenge the status quo. It's it's what you'll see is things will swap out. So again, the Twitter debate at the moment is if Twitter Twitter has as a model probably will still exist in some form, but whether it is Twitter and whether it's something else in the same way as kind of TikTok has come up and that's become a thing where Facebook's kind of going down and becoming a, mm. I think you, it's like as one rises, the other one decreases. I, I think that's like a, it's a fashion thing. It's isn't a fashion it? thing. Because the kids who are growing up don't want to go on a Facebook. So that's, that's right. For, for their your parents, you know, and, yeah. and it's for the old people. And yeah. It's really boring. Yeah. So they want their own. Yeah. So they, they, they grow up and they come into the, the world and, and want to create their own uh, platforms and, and share stuff just between them and their pals and, yeah. and their friends and stuff. So I think that, that's that's why it will just continue to shift, I think. Yeah. Yes, you're right, actually. I had not thought about that for a long time, but I remember noticing the fashion component yeah. to apps being really unusual, um, yeah. but because, you know, the most popular social network is the one that's appealing to teenagers at a given time, and they say yeah. for people in the sort of millennial bracket that we're in, Facebook was the first cool thing, yeah. and yeah. then when the parents moved in, everyone ran to Instagram, <laughs> exactly. and then the parents found out about Instagram, so they run to TikTok. Yeah. Exactly. TikTok will probably experience the same fate yeah. at some oh, point. I think it will, yeah. It will. I think yeah. It will. yeah. Because as soon as Gen Z, at my age, it won't be cool anymore. And also all the brands are going on there. Right. So all the brands go on there. As soon as the brands rush on, it's like, not cool on. anymore. Exactly, yeah. They'll want to find their own. I forgot that that was actually the tension in the movie The Social Network, you know, that Eduardo uh, Savarin, the finance director, was saying we need to advertise to get some revenue and Zuckerberg saying as soon as we advertise, we won't be cool. <laughs> it's kind of ironic seeing Facebook <laughs> saying that. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, so. it's, it's, yeah, exactly, it's exactly that. It's, that's the cycle, isn't it? The chase for money means you bring in advertising, brands come on, 
And again, that's why brands are like early adopters. I think that that's where it's changed. TV was never like that. TV was just TV. It was always there. Whereas now it's like the earliest brands will go to the kind of net, uh, the social networks early and they'll be the ones that go and trying to get in there, try and be cool. But that has a very finite mm. period of time before that becomes naff and then you have to jump on the next one. Yeah. So then the craft, again, goes back to that craft point where it's hard to get great at it because you've already got your eye on the next one that's coming along. And yeah. in terms of how are they doing it, what's cool on that network, how's, <laughs> how do they go about film? Is it, you know, what's, how do they approach it? One and a half second. Yeah, exactly. Lip One and a half second. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Shoot me now. Yeah, and then, yeah, the, the, that, that uh, imagine a two second advert would suddenly become much more viable if we discover some way of, you know, basically like we can slow down our perception of time. So two seconds seems like 20 and then you can charge more for that space. Who knows what's going to happen, but the future is, uh, uh, it sounds like a George Bush quote, the future is going to be an interesting place. Um, just focusing on the present for another minute, because how long have we been on now, Chris, by the way? I don't have a clock, so... Oh, cool. Right. Well, brilliant time. So at the time of recording, it's the Christmas campaign. What has impressed you guys the most? Asda. Yep. Yeah, I like the Asda. Just in, in a classic old school, this is a, a feel-good, funny, very on-brand. not brand. pretentious. Not pretentious at all. Uh, the, the way that the, the, the kind of staff react to him when he comes in and stuff, it's just very Asda and it feels feels funny, I think. Um, it, it'll go down well with a, a lot, maybe not the advertising I mean, that, that's, who, that's the goal. Who knows? That's the interesting thing, isn't it? Yeah. But, but I think in the real world, with real folks, I think they'll really love it. But it's, it's good to hear that because, again, the discussion is always what the advertisers think are cool. And you like yeah. forget that most people don't, they don't even, they don't want to watch advertising. <laughs> and so if you've got one that appeals to real people, then so yeah. much the better. I think yeah, so. I mean, I'd agree. I'd say Asda is definitely the standout one. And again, even if you go into a, an Asda and see how they brought it through with, again, it's like simple stuff, but it, as soon as you walk into Asda, you get reminded of the advert and it's kind of, they're selling cushions with his face on. Going, <laughs> and then people are lapping it up, loving it. And it goes back to saying, it's just it's simple fun, honest fun that you go, oh, that puts a smile on my face. It's not too worthy, not too heavy. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it was, it's light relief in some respects in terms of the Christmas ads. They, get, they were getting a bit too... Yeah, kind of heavy and a bit like, oh God, we need to make this one even more emotional. Yeah. And, yeah. and suddenly you've got a, the daft elf from years ago comes yeah. back. You're like, all right, this is going to be all right. And it, and it feels, I mean, it was probably quite a tough brief this year for a lot of the brands. And it kind of, and, and I'm sure in a, in a lot of the spiel in the brief is going to be about, you know, times are tough and not, there's not much money floating around and the world's burning and it's, it's terrible and there's lots of bad news. And I think it, there's a tendency to kind of go, okay, do we reflect a little bit of that in 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 the work, or you know, reflect how people are, are thinking? They're not going to be splashing cash everywhere. Yeah. Then they just get a big big elf that's just <laughs> going to make people laugh. And I think that, that that's also what people need in those times, you know, in those yeah. times of kind of depression. <laughs> you've made a, a, a good point uh, there, which is that makes it sound kind of patronizing. Like you've made a good point there for once. <laughs> no, no. Um, so At least that, I got one. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching the one, the McDonald's one by Leo's and, you know, they spent, they got Tom Hooper to direct it with his Oscar, you know, and things like that. And it's, um, you can see the, the, it, I, it made, it did make me emotional um, but you can see the transparency of the message, not criticizing in case Mark watches this and, and Chaka, <laughs> um, which is, you know, the kid writes a wish list and then it all blows away. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, you're not going to get anything yeah. you want. It's like a yeah. straight on <laughs> recession. <laughs> like yeah. recession. No happened. presence issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then the last bit is like the bit that he like manages to retain yeah. is like a picture of him in the family. It's like, oh, yeah. the things yeah. that yeah. matter yeah. are still there. Yeah. Uh, you're right. Asda didn't even go near that subject. Yeah. There's like, here's something funny. What yeah. do you reckon? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think so. And all, all the better for it. I think again, it, it that's why it makes it stand out. Obviously, it's we've talked about it earlier about again, it's kind of borrowed interest there with the elf, and then they've added it and just come into the market that is quite quite worthy and a bit emotional, and it feels like it's a real stir up of, yeah. of, of kind of traditional Christmas ads in the UK anyway. I think it felt like oh wow, this is a good way to go about it. So it's funny, isn't it, that in times of plenty, it used to be the Christmas campaign season was a shootout between like expensive brands John Lewis <laughs> mm. was always the king yeah, of that yeah. that that, mm. that time and then I remember my first the first time I was ever as a normal person having any discussion about advertising was 2014 when it was like do you prefer the John Lewis ad or the controversial <laughs> Sainsbury's ad yeah. with the World War One? Yeah. do you remember that one yeah. the trenches yeah, yeah. 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 
Um, loved, it, loved it. And me and my friends who were like, you know, at the time we were early 20s and we were trying to be like in a, you know, sort of a, 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 a punk ethic rock band. Like, we don't like <laughs> brands, but we were arguing about saying things like John Lewis. <laughs> yeah, that's the, um, the last time I remember about that. But uh, the only other point, uh, uh, when we were talking about borrowing IP, the only other thing that makes me a little bit upset about the modern age is not, you know, borrowed interest is fine. But this stuff is old. This content is a long time out of date. And I'm like, I'm trying to scratch my head thinking, what have we actually had in the last 10 years that's original <laughs> and people like it? You know, there's been there's so much Marvel, there's so much flipping, yeah, that's interesting. you know, rebooting yeah. and just rerunning. And I don't know, that's not really a question, it's an observation. Yeah, no, that, that is an interesting observation, isn't it? Yeah. Because Will Ferrell was oldish when he made the movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. like not, you know, yeah. not, not actually, yeah. because he was probably about he was old to me because I was a kid. He was probably about forty-two or something yeah. like that. But yeah. I suppose it might it might not be traditional tropes. It might be something that is again we talked about the TikTok generation that, that's in there <laughs> that that becomes the center of a, a campaign in the next five to ten years time. I think that's because because it's not as linear as it once was. That the kind of inspiration for the next five to ten years will be will be in weird places. The thing yeah. is, the difficulty is, is it, is it mass market enough? Because that's what every brand needs is that reach and that mass appeal. Whereas it's fine when it's linear and it's elf and it's, but then once you go past that and it becomes slightly niche, yep. brands always worry about that going, well, has that got the reach? Does everyone know about that? And yeah. I think that's where it might get a bit more interesting, but either that or they have to just look further and further back. Well, that's one thing that Laurel makes... and Hardy, stuff like that. That's always good. <laughs> yeah. Again, we get, get reference like that. that. I'd like that. Yeah, it'd be mm. good. So the kids it's are really into fun. Pete and Dud, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. Maybe, or, <laughs> I'm a bit um, sweary. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or eight to reference, I mean, the greatest stand-up comedian of all time, just turned 80, Billy Connolly, one yeah. of uh, the yeah, greatest yeah. exports yeah, of, yeah, um, yeah. of Scotland. Uh, the uh, thing that upsets me about the modern media landscape, really, is that it feels like there's no, there's no watering hole that everyone goes to anymore. There's no, you know, in the, in the 90s there were four channels mm -hmm. and the cinema had yeah. 10 films on yeah. and I kind of miss everyone having seen the same stuff yeah. but I don't know if that's I don't know if that's just going to be a legacy thing like mm -hmm. that doesn't happen anymore who knows I think it happens to an extent doesn't it Still, you know that there's, there's everyone's watching a certain thing on Netflix mm -hmm. for a certain You're right, yeah. time isn't it but yeah. it's, it's definitely different um, what's the thing everyone's talking about at the moment it's not Stranger Things, is it? That's already happened. Is there a new series, of The Crown? I don't know. Yeah, there, well, yeah, there was. Wasn't, yeah, yeah. I think, I think gaming will play more of a part in that. You know, yes. Like, see, launches of games will become the kind of center point on on social anyway. That that hype around that will become big. I think. Like again, I think the younger generation are much more interested in the launch of the new FIFA, yeah, true. or again, Call, Call of Duty or something like that. That yeah. becomes yeah, and they're old games, it's an old franchise game. But you know, it's kind of that that kind of when they drop become the cultural focus point where they're all because mm -hmm. they gaming still spans quite a an age group i think yes it's quite does, interesting yeah. is it it's one of the last ones where it's not naff that there's a 40 year old playing call of duty and then there's a an 18 16 year old kid playing call of duty it's it does have that breadth because of the anonymity of it where yeah. you kind of be, yeah, be, behind true. the wall so i think yeah that, that they'll be the bits where on social people might kind of congregate around and then how you as advertisers and brands interact with that and and get in front of those people will be interesting, I think. No, you're right about the gaming thing. Was, they were thinking a lot recently about why music seems to be less important to teenagers now than it was, and it doesn't mean mm. it's unimportant to them. But at one, it felt like it was everything mm. to teenagers at some point if you were like a fan of Nirvana. Yeah. Like your entire room was yeah. decorated like that or, you know, anything before that, Beatles and the Stones onwards. Uh, and I guess we kind of figured out that at one point music was the only way a teenager mm. could express themselves yeah. or have a real deep interest in something mm. their parents wouldn't get. But now you've got video games, yeah. you've got yeah. TikTok, you've yeah. got yeah. YouTubers and all this stuff. So, That's interesting. Isn't yeah, maybe there's just... Um, well, yeah, like you said, it would be foolish to just try and lean on the things that used to be expressions yeah. of youth culture. And yeah. gaming is definitely a, a, just an enormous yeah. thing that wasn't around even when we were yeah, younger. Exactly. You know, gaming mm -hmm. was for, it wasn't that cool when I was yeah. a kid. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think it was kind of much smaller audience now. It's, it's huge, isn't no, it's it? huge, so, yeah. Yeah. Just talking talk about the music thing, my, my son's into, uh, like I say, he's, he's nearly 14, and he's into 90s hip hop. Right. Now, 
I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> it's kind of like, what, <laughs> what do you mean? What's drawn into it? Yeah, where, where, where does it where does it come from? Where does it start? It's not me that's been you know playing yeah. Doctor Dre. Yeah, in, in, <laughs> maybe a little bit, but, but not, I know what not, you mean. I see what you're going well, at so, there. So where so where where does that come yeah. from? When it's, yeah. it's where, like it would have been your parents' record collection first, yeah. but it isn't you in this case. And, and, and to the, to them, it's that that point I made about being retro. Um, you know, we get that quite a bit as well, that this audience are really into re retro things from year 2000 or, or 90s or whatever it is. So it, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't, I don't know where it comes from, but it, it it's a thing. Yeah. It, and it is there. So, yeah, maybe maybe that's how we keep the um, that nostalgia thing going and, and that will kind of play a part in in some of the ads and some of the ideas that, that we're doing to that audience. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. But it's going to feel be... like we're, we're, we're plucking things from 40 years ago, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I mean, it's also it's also the case that pop culture only existed really from 1960 onwards. So yeah. actually for a long time, there was a pretty small pool of things to draw from. Yeah. And now it's actually really big. You can, you know, you 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 will you will get, as you said, people who were, were not born until the late 2000s listening to stuff from the 80s not like it's a thing whereas if you know you're born in 92 what's I'm trying to do the maths now it's like it'd be like me listening to stuff from like 1950 or yeah. something yeah. like that yeah, you know yeah, like yeah, skiffle yeah. <laughs> 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 that's weird why is the kids it's <laughs> um, hey, always we'll, been different yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see we'll see what the future holds um I, go, I was gonna go out on a controversial final question it's controversial because um, I don't know. I'm not really part of this culture. I'm looking at Chris because he is. I don't know if it's insensitive to ask, but any predictions for the World Cup, which is currently going on? You'll be right or wrong by the time this goes out. So <laughs> it's 28th of November. What do you reckon, guys? Uh, I mean, we're both England fans. We'd absolutely love it if we if we did it. Um, uh, looking at Brazil, yeah. I can't see much. Statistically, too, too far, you just really, take towards Brazil, Brazil, don't you? Brazil or uh, France? Yeah, France yeah, are looking France good as well, good. aren't they? But do you think that'll be the final, Brazil, France? It could be, yeah. I don't know how the, hope not. the draw. <laughs> yeah, hope not. Yeah. Hope not. How the draw is going to work out, but yeah, I can't see much beyond Brazil. Yeah. Fair enough. I can't see much beyond Brazil. Will be the, the as the podcast went out. That'll be the final note. And <laughs> these guys are going to get back to find themselves fired for saying they're England fans now. <laughs> but it's been really good. Thanks for coming down, guys. And I'm really looking forward to seeing this new era of Leith and what it can bring. And hopefully, we'll be seeing a lot more of you now. You're going to be coming to Manchester. So absolutely, yeah. That'll oh, be thanks brilliant. For yes, thanks for yeah, having us. It's been, it's been my pleasure.